Welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number five, Enlightenment and Truth. We're recording on May 9th, 2017. All right, so this is a series on enlightenment, what it is, how to become either enlightened more, or more enlightened. And today we're going to like focus on the need to have kind of like an accurate view of reality to be enlightened. Um, there are some people, for example, that might claim to be enlightened, but um, for example, they may believe the earth is flat or that the earth or the world is 6,000 years old or, um, or for example, there was a Garden of Eden. And I mean, you know, it's understandable that um, our ancestors had some of these beliefs in the past because that's all they knew. That's what evidence, you know, suggested to them. But in, in today's world, you know, you can't really kind of like be enlightened, uh, having th those kinds of views. So, so basically, we, we need to have like an appreciation of science and logic. You know, and sometimes, you know, like the science really goes against the logic. This world, as I'll get into a bit later in the show, is a lot more strange than, than um, many of us would uh, believe. All right, so for example, we want to kind of like understand the, the universe as we know it, what we can observe, and there may be more like that, that came before us and that may, may come after us, but what, what we can observe is like about 14 billion years old, 13.8 um, billion years old. And, um, and so here's like, so all right, so that's the Big Bang, right? About 14 billion years ago. But then logic tells us, well, you know, there was probably something that happened before. And so like, um, you know, basically because of the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, you know, the, the universe is kind of like becoming more and more disorganized and it's actually, you know, it's expanding and the, ex the expansion is accelerating. So like we may end up with a kind of a, a big, um, cr uh, just like actually like this, this cold death or <laughs> nothing, you know, um, Everything is so far apart from each other that nothing, you know, that nothing happens in a certain sense. Or it, gravity may pull everything back together into a big crunch. They really don't know that, but the idea is like whatever the case might be, it seems that reality, you know, the, both the observable universe and whatever um, lies outside of it, seems to be eternal. You know, had an eternal past and has an uh, eternal future. Um, and we want, of course, like we, you know, with this, the Garden of Eden, I mean, it, it was a myth. I mean, the, the world is older than 6,000 years. Uh, you know, there wasn't a talking serpent, you know, and, a, and a, two humans just created like as we human, modern humans appear now. You know, um, basically, we have to kind of like accept that we are the product of evolution, that all life forms, all modern life forms evolved from previous life forms. Um, and, you know, I think life emerged on the planet, I think about 4.5 billion years ago. So, like, this evolution has been going on for a very long time. Okay. Um, now, with evolution, you know, there is a, there's some confusion in science in terms of, like, what evolution means. And others, some, some people believe that evolution is just a random process, that, you know, it has no purpose, no goal. But, um, you know, they, they kind of like claim that, uh, for example, that mutations, basically we evolved through these various kinds of mutations. Um, our genes mutate, our DNA mut mutates. And some people will claim that these mutations just happen randomly, meaning for no reason, for no purpose. But um, that, that just doesn't seem to make sense because like, imagine, let's say, um, DNA um, kind of like changing, mutating in such a state that, let's say, an arm eventually becomes a wing, okay? And like before, you know, natural selection kicks in to a certain extent where, um, where some, some organisms evolve in a certain way and others evolve in a different way. And the, the changes, the mutations that that are most beneficial are the ones that are, you know, carried on through natural selection. The, those organisms survive where the, the other ones, less successful ones, die off. 
And so like, but what happens is with mutations, there's like, before there's any noticeable change in the physiology of different organisms, before natural selection can kick in, there has to be a guided design process that, that's, that's leading this evolution, that's basically planning it out. Okay, I'll get, get into that a bit later when we talk about God, I guess. Um, all right, and some, you know, some religions, a lot of religions, a lot of people who claim to be enlightened, uh, claim to have a certainty about what happens after death. Um, I think one way you can understand that many, if not all, of these kinds of like conceptions are, are wrong is that there are so many different kinds. You know, one religion, some, some people will say one thing happens, other people say something else happens. And um, basically, you know, I think the fact is we don't know. We may, we may eventually know. We have people that are frozen, cryonics, that like, you know, basically if we find a way to um, <laughs> revive them, you know, it's technic technologically just um, not possible right now. But if we find a way to revive them and uh, get some more evidence in terms of what actually happens, then we might know. But, you know, that has to remain an open question. Okay, um, then like, you know, there, there came to be some misconceptions about the nature of reality that, that came about in the early 1900s with the advent of quantum mechanics, quantum physics. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of, of how these mis misconceptions came about, but for example, one mistaken conclusion that people have is that like we human beings you know are necessary for things to happen in the world uh, that's one of that's a quantum interpretation of, of you know, it's called the copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and it basically says that like it, it there's there's kind of like a a question if if a, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one to hear it does it make a sound all right so like some people would claim, no, it doesn't make a sound because there's nobody there to hear it. But no, it does make a sound. We have like instruments that would detect that sound. In other words, what I'm trying to say is like human beings are not necessary for reality to exist. They're not necessary for events to take place. That's not to say that we human beings cannot sometimes influence events or make events happen. But certain events are completely beyond our control. And it's, it, this is pretty obvious because like, you know, the universe was, um, I mean, human beings are what, 100,000, 200,000 years old, the modern version. Um, God, again, uh, life is 4.5 billion years old. There was like, there was a lot happening in the universe before human beings, before even life was, was created. So basically the idea that like people's consciousness is necessary to what happens, just, just, it's just logically and scientifically un unsound. Um, another kind of like miss conclusion that that you'll hear hear a lot a lot of enlightened people you know talk about and this is relative to free will we we'll get into this a bit later also is they um, they suggest that some things happen without a cause and this is like briefly it's about this Heisenberg uncertainty principle that be, because we can simultaneously measure both the position and moment, momentum of a particle that not only do these particles not have a simultaneous m momentum of position, which they do, it's just we can't detect it, but some physicists and then like, kind of like guided by these m physicists' misconclusions, some people who claim to be enlightened say, well, no, some things can happen uncaused. You know, that things just happen. No, in our universe, you know, there's, there are laws, like the conservation laws, that prohibit things from just happening. Um, and again, this, this has implications for free will. Um, now, all right, so now matter does, you know, um, our, our mind does affect matter, you know, and matter affects mind. I mean, matter affects mind in other words, like if we drink coffee or drink alcohol or something, you know, we're ingesting something physical into our system and our consciousness is changing as a result. There's this um, problem in philosophy, the mind, um, the hard problem of human consciousness is if our bodies are physical, how can we count for a consciousness that doesn't seem to be physical? I tend to be a physicalist in the sense that I believe that everything is physical. 
but, but this relates to it. So we understand how matter can affect our mind, and then we have to also recognize that our mind can affect our matter. I mean, this is, you know, it's not like, there is a tradition of parapsychology, paranormal phenomenon, that it actually have been, it's been verified, you know, by Princeton University, Duke, Stanford, MIT, different um, colleges have, have studied this for decades, but most people don't believe in it. But actually, there, there's a, um, a kind of a mind over matter paradigm or a way of demonstrating that that is it's like it's it's without contention it, it, it's the, the consensus is that it absolutely exists and that's what's known as the placebo effect in other words like uh, medicine you know completely accepts the placebo effect and in fact you know when when pharmaceutical companies are testing out let's say a new antidepressant or a new kind of like uh, psychotropic medication you know basically they have to go through much more trials, much more of a rigorous uh, examination because this placebo effect um, interacts. Basically, the placebo effect is like you, you tell somebody that, um, that you're giving them a pill and that pill is going to ease their pain. Okay, what happens is like you can give, be giving them a sugar pill, but if they believe that that pill has some kind of like because like a lot of our medicine does work, and it, it works without the placebo effect, but if you tell somebody that this pill is going to like ease um, their pain, uh, it works. You know, their mind, simply the belief that the pill will work, makes it work. Um, and it's interesting. You give them a bigger pill, the pl placebo effect is greater. You give them an injection, the placebo effect is even greater. You, uh, a guy in a, in a white lab coat administers the injection, the placebo effect is even greater. So again, like, we have this, like, the, the fundamental um, point that I'm making here is, like, that mind affects matter, matter affects mind, and it could really be that matter and mind probably is, are, this, are different kind of manifestations of the same stuff. This isn't like a... Um, a kind of like a unique thing in, in nature. For example, they've discovered, they used to think there, there was energy in the universe and then there was matter or mass. And now they understand that actually all energy contains mass and all mass contains energy. There are some exceptions like photons that have no mass and all, but in general, you know, mass and energy are, you know, basically manifestations. That's what E equals MC squared is about. Just basically they're they transform between each other all the time. So, but again, so like, you know, matter affects mind, mind affects matter. Okay, God. Okay, um, now most, you know, it depends on the tradition. Some people who claim to be enlightened will claim that there is no evidence of God. Um, I, I, we, can, we can prove, I think, I think it's a truth, it's a logical truth that, that God exists, and it depends on how you defend God. I mean, before there was a... Um, the term universe, meaning everything, you know, what, what people held to mean, mean everything before that was, was God. God, that was one of God's attributes. You know, God had other attributes, and I'll actually get to this. I think we have time to do this, you know, just briefly. So basically, God, if you define God as, as omnipresent, as everything, basically from that attribute, you can derive, let's say, four other major attributes. For example, if God is everything, I'm omnipresent, how can God not be, for example, eternal? Okay, so like, you know, everything, you know, is like everything today, it was everything yesterday, it's everything tomorrow, it's everything going into the past and into the future. So if you define God as eternal, yes, God exists. If you define God as omnipotent or all-powerful, how can God be everything and not have power over everything. You know, obviously, if God is everything, God is the only power, um, then, like, we get into kind of, like, you know, um, how we mean words. In other words, like, God is supposed to be eternal, but then um, God is also deemed to be the creator. So, when, so like, we have to, like, in this sense, if we're going to define God as a creator, then we have to refer to the Big Bang. Now, 100 years ago, 200 years ago especially, um, there was no conception of a Big Bang. You know, there was no demonstration that there was a creation that, that they, you know, we thought that 
you know, reality had just existed in its present state eternally, in which case the, 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 the case for a creation would have been a bit more difficult. But since the Big Bang occurred, you know, since we have evidence of this, and that's our, our current scientific understanding, then we can, like, date, um, affirm that God defined as the creator does make sense because the creation is, in fact, the Big Bang. Okay, and the last of these, like, you know, five basic traits of God that, that show that you can logically prove God's existence, it's not a matter of faith as a lot of religions will have you believe, is that God is omniscient or God knows everything. Again, this, this can be derived from the first attribute that God is everything. Is God, if God is ever present, omnipresent, or everything, there is no way that God can't know everything because to be everything has to be to know everything. And now, it's like everything that can be known. It's just like, just like for example, let's back up with this, um, this trait of omnipotence. Uh, omnipotence doesn't mean that God can do anything. In other words, God can't make uh, 1 plus 1 equal 3. Okay, there are certain things God can't do. It's just like whatever can be done, whatever does happen, is attributable to God. All right, so that's another truth that I think, you know, is necessary to, you know, to enlightenment because it's, it's, it's the way things are. Okay, um, so, and, and now a couple of things that God isn't, and this is, you know, this goes in the face of a lot of modern religions, is like, if God is everything and God is all-powerful and God is eternal and the Creator and all that, you can't say that God is all good. Okay, some religions say, well, no, God is omnibenevolent. Uh, God is all good, you know. It'd be nice if God was, um, but first of all, you know, like the Bible in Isaiah, God is like quoted by Isaiah as saying like, well, I create um, light, I create darkness, I create good, I create evil. But beyond that, the logic, if God is everything, you know, and God has power over everything, there's, all, there's no way that God can just be good, um, good and not evil. And again, when, when we're talking about evil, we're defining it in terms of what um, John Locke described goodness as being as goodness is that which creates happiness or pleasure. So, all right, so, and God can't be transcendent either, okay? In other words, like some people say that God exists outside of existence, of, of the world. No, if God is everything. God is what may be outside of this observable universe that we have. Um, there is, God cannot transcend God. You know, everything is everything. That means what, whatever might seem to transcend this reality. All right, so, now, back to our universe it is strange. There's some, some phenomenon that, you know, that we know to be true, but it defies logic, or at least our understanding, or it, doesn't, it defies our understanding of logic, or our logic based on the available evidence. For example, um, you can have one of two kind of like entangled particles uh, at one end of the universe, and another at the other end. And these, these particles are entangled, means that they're combined in such a way where, for example, and this is theoretical, but, but they've proven it at, at smaller scales. Uh, if, if, let's say, you, um, you shift the polarity of one particle from up to down instantaneously at a rate hundred, thousands of times faster than the speed of light, um, which is the fastest thing we know of in general, uh, the other particle will, will shift its polarity in the opposite direction. In other words, the first one is shifting. If you shift it um, up to down, the other one will shift down to up because they have to kind of like maintain this complementarity, this like this this uh, relationship to each other. So that's really really strange. And like as Einstein showed with with uh, special and general rel relativity, you know, time isn't this constant that always flows at a certain rate. Um, you know, if you're if you like take a spaceship and travel really super fast out into the outer space and come back, um, theoretically, you could be you could have aged maybe five minutes, but everyone but you could return to an Earth that is like five thousand years into the future. I mean, that, that's really strange, but this is like this is the world we live in, and um, space contracts and expands, time contracts and expands, depending on the motion of the objects relative to each other, on the speed and all. So again, it's, it's not that our universe isn't strange. Okay, now a lot of this truth that we're talking about, um, all right, with, with relativity, Einstein's um, discoveries have had profound 
um, influences on our technology, on the world we have today. You know, I mean, just so much is is was dependent on on this this understanding of of of, of, of nature, of this physical you know understanding of nature, the quantum mechanics, all, all that. Um, but a lot of it, a lot of what um, um, scientific truth does isn't all that practical to our everyday lives. So let's just focus on some things, some truths that are like necessary to enlightenment that I believe are um, quite practical. The first truth is that happiness is what we want. It's really the only thing we want. Okay, Aristotle defined happiness as the highest good, and he also said that it's the only mean end, end in life, that, that basically Everything else in life is a means. It's a means to happiness. So whatever we do, anytime we do something, it's always to move us or other people in direction in the direction of greater happiness, less unhappiness, greater pleasure, less pain. And yes, yeah, sometimes we make investments. Sometimes, for example, we might run a marathon because we predict that that's going to create greater pleasure for us. Okay, and sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we we might. Um, you know, let's say get a PhD thinking that like, well, if we, if we have a bachelor's, we get a master's, a PhD, we're going to be happier. No, a lot of times, you know, the evidence has shown that our, our predictions about what are, what's going to make us happier are mistaken. But, but in general, we're always seeking to happiness, and happiness is why we're here. You know, it's an emotion, it's a feeling, it's not a thought. And to the extent we get that right, we'll, we'll create a much happier world. Okay, the second... Um, point is we do not have a free will. It's impossible for us to have a free will. Very briefly, I, I did 216 episodes of this. I just finished them up on a um, series called Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. I've written a couple of books on it. And basically, just very briefly, it's like if every one of our decisions has a cause, and you know everything has a cause, I mean, that's a, a, a basic understanding of nature, then that means we make a decision, and, and these causes like the cause of whatever it's causing happens before what it causes. So basically, you make a decision, that has a cause that came before what you decided, and that cause also has a cause, because again, everything has a cause, so, and the cause to that cause is behind it, or you know, uh, in the past, and the cause of that cause came earlier than that. So what you have is a chain of cause and effect regressing back, cause by cause by cause, far back before you were born, back before the planet was created. And that's the fundamental reason why free will is impossible, why, why absolutely nothing we do is in any way up to us. Nothing that happens in our world, nothing, you know, nothing moves that, that is free of this causal law, this law of cause and effect. All right, so like, that's important. Again, we'll, we'll devote other episodes to that. Um, climate change is real, and it is threatening definitely threatening the survival of civilization as we know it. If we don't get our act together, you know, by 2100, you know, we might be reduced to, to half a billion people from the 7.5 billion we have now. And like, you know, the kind of world that we live in will, will not exist because the temperatures will be so extreme because there will be pandemics because like, you know, as the temperature increases, these microorganisms breathe, breathe more quickly and, and they, you know, the infectious diseases increase and all. It'll be, it'll be like, you know, chaos. So, so basically, it's, this is a truth that's it's very important to recognize. You can't be enlightened and not recognize it. Um, and it might be just also, um, it might lead to the extinction, extinction excuse me, of, of the species. Um, okay, another major truth. We've got about three minutes left. We'll try to get through this. Uh, animals are sentient. Um, you know, animals feel, and right now about 65 billion animals per year are tortured in these factory farms that we have because we tell ourselves, no, they don't feel pain like we do. Yes, they do. And uh, if you, you know, like, if you're, if you're like 80, 90 percent of us who believe in God, or at least believe that, that, you know, that we are judged by nature or whatever for what we do, then whether it's climate change or a lot of kind of like the suffering that we go through, you can't tell yourself that it's not because of what we've done. Now, yeah, fine. Uh, it's not really our fault because like, you know, this chain of cause and effect compels us to do what we do. But again, if we want the best future for not just ourselves, but just uh, for compassion's sake, you know, to stop hurting these animals, we'll recognize this and, and um, change our, 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 the way we farm animals or perhaps even better go vegan. 
Okay, there, there are about one to two billion people who live in extreme poverty. Their kids die at a rate of 30,000 each day. And basically the richer countries in the world purposely keep these countries poor so that we can buy natural resources um, from them at a much, and labor at a, at a, a much more affordable, cheaper price. So it's, 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 it's really inhumane. Um, but that's a truth we, we, we shouldn't um, discount or, or deny. Okay, we're all connected. Our emotions are contagious. If we're kind of like ignoring people around us who are not happy, that's going to diminish our level of happiness. Okay, so we are one. You know, it's not like we're separate from each other. Um, we are God. We're just, you know, like everything. If God, is God, if God is everything, we are a part of God. It's just we're not the part of God that decides anything. It's like my hand is a part of me. It doesn't get to decide anything, right? So we're a part of God. Everything's a part of God. Again, we just don't decide anything. All right, we've gotten through this. So like, all right, in future episodes, we're going to get into more detail regarding what some people who claim to be enlightened say that isn't so. You know, you'll, you'll hear um, people like Deepak, Deepak Chopra, Chopra, whatever, um, he'll say that like, yes, that, um, that human beings, you know, or have this kind of like ability to transcend the physical laws and, for example, have a free will. You know, or you say some people, some quote unquote enlightened people will say, well, no, most people don't have a free will, but if you, come very, if you become very enlightened, you will have one. So in future episodes, we will explore these kinds of like misconceptions of reality and show how, no, you can't really be enlightened when, when you hold these, you know, mistaken views of reality. All right, well, that is, that's it for today's show. Next week, we're going to be back with something else. And, you know, eventually we're going to interview people in the area who've had different training on what their views of enlightenment are. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Ortega Path to Enlightenment.